Book 6. So long-suffering great Odyssea slept in that place in an exhaustion of sleep and weariness, and now Athene went her way to the district and city of the Phaeacian men, who formerly lived in the spacious land, Hyperia, next to the Cyclopes, who were men too overbearing, and who had kept harrying them, being greater in strength. From here godlike Norsethus had removed and led a migration, and settled in Scyria, far away from men who eat bread, and driven a wall about the city, and built the houses, and made the temples of the gods, and allotted the holdings. But now he had submitted to his fate, and gone to Hades, and Alcinous, learned in designs from the gods, now ruled there. It was to his house that the grey-eyed goddess Athene went, devising the homecoming of great-hearted Odysseus, and she went into the ornate chamber, in which a girl was sleeping, like the immortal goddesses for stature and beauty, Nausicaa, the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous, and beside her two handmaidens with beauty given from the graces slept on either side of the post with the shining doors closed. She drifted in like a breath of wind to where the girl slept, and came and stood above her head and spoke a word to her, likening herself to the daughter of Dimas, famed for seafaring, a girl of the same age, in whom her fancy delighted. In this likeness the grey-eyed Athene spoke to her, Nausicaa, how could your mother have a child so careless? The shining clothes are lying away and cared for, while your marriage is not far off, when you should be in your glory for clothes to wear, and provide too for those who attend you. It is from such things that a good reputation among people springs up, giving pleasure to your father and the lady your mother. So let us go on a washing tomorrow when dawn shows. I too will go along with you and help you, so you can have all done most quickly, since you will not long stay unmarried. For already you are being courted by all the best men of the Phaeacians hereabouts, and you too are a Phaeacian. So come, urge your famous father early in the morning to harness the mules and wagon for you, and it shall carry the sashes and dresses and shining coverlets for you. In this way it will be so much more becoming than for you to go there on foot, for the washing places are a long way from the city. So the grey-eyed Athene spoke and went away from her to Olympos, where the abode of the god stands firm and unmoving forever, they say, and is not shaken with winds nor spattered with rains, nor does snow pile ever there, but the shining bright air stretches cloudless away, and the white light glances upon it. And there, and all their days, the blessed gods take their pleasure. There the grey-eyed one went, when she had talked with the young girl. And the next the dawn came, throned in splendor, and wakened the well-robed girl Nausicaa, and she wondered much at her dreaming, and went through the house, so as to give the word to her parents, to her dear father and her mother. She found them within there, the queen was sitting by the fireside with her attendant women, turning sea-purple yarn on a distaff, her father she met as he was going out the door to the council of famed barons, where the proud Phaeacians used to summon him. She stood very close up to her dear father and spoke to him, Daddy dear, will you not have them harness me the wagon, the high one with the good wheels, so that I can take the clothing to the river and wash it? Now it is lying about, all dirty, and you yourself, when you sit among the first men in council and share their counsels, ought to have clean clothing about you, and also, you have five dear sons who are grown in the palace, two of them married, and other three are sprightly bachelors, and they are forever wanting clean fresh clothing, to wear it when they go to dance, and it is my duty to think about all this. So she spoke, but she was ashamed to speak of her joyful marriage to her dear father, but he understood all and answered, I do not begrudge you the mules, child, nor anything else. So go, and the serving men will harness the wagon, the high one with the good wheels that has the carrying basket. He spoke, and gave the order to the serving men. These obeyed, and brought the mule wagon with good wheels outside and put it together, and led the mules under the yoke and harnessed them, and the girl brought the bright clothing out from the inner chamber and laid it in the well-polished wagon. Meanwhile her mother put in a box all manner of food, which would preserve strength, and put many good things to eat with it, and poured out wine in a goatskin bottle, and her daughter put that in the wagon. She gave her limpid olive oil in a golden oil flask for her and her attendant women to use for anointing. Nausicaa took up the whip and the shining reins, then whipped them into a start and the mules went noisily forward and pulled without stint, carrying the girl and the clothing. She was not alone. The rest, her handmaidens, walked on beside her. Now when they had come to the delightful stream of the river, where there was always a washing place, and plenty of glorious water that ran through to wash what was ever so dirty, there they unyoked the mules and set them free from the wagon, and chased them out along the bank of the swirling river to graze on the sweet river grass, while they from the wagon lifted the wash in their hands and carried it to the black water, and stamped on it in the basins, making a race and game of it until they
had washed and rinsed all dirt away, then spread it out in line along the beach of the sea, where the water of the sea had washed the most big pebbles up on the dry shore. Then they themselves, after bathing and anointing themselves with olive oil, ate their dinner all along by the banks of the river and waited for the laundry to dry out in the sunshine. But when she and her maids had taken their pleasure in eating, they all threw off their veils for a game of ball, and among them it was Nausicaa of the white arms who led in the dancing, and as Artemis, who showers arrows, moves on the mountains either along Tejatos or on high-towering Erymanthos, delighting in boars and deer in their running, and along with her the nymphs, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, range in the wilds and play, and the heart of Leto is gladdened, for the head and the Brows of Artemis are above all the others, and she is easily marked among them, though all are lovely, so this one shone among her handmaidens, a virgin unwed. But now, when she was about ready once more to harness the mules, and fold the splendid clothing, and start on the way home, then the grey-eyed goddess Athene thought what to do next, how Odysseus should awake, and see the well-favoured young girl, and she should be his guide to the city of the Phaeacians. Now the princess threw the ball toward one handmaiden, and missed the girl, and the ball went into the swirling water, and they all cried out aloud, and noble Odysseus wakened and sat up and began pondering in his heart and his spirit, Ah me, what are the people whose land I have come to this time, and are they violent and savage, and without justice, or hospitable to strangers, with a godly mind? See now how an outcry of young women echoes about me, of nymphs, who keep the sudden and sheer high mountain places and springs of the rivers and grass of the meadows, or am I truly in the neighbourhood of human people I can converse with? But come now, I myself shall see what I can discover. So speaking, great Odysseus came from under his thicket, and from the dense foliage with his heavy hand he broke off a leafy branch to cover his body and hide the male parts, and went in the confidence of his strength, like some hill-kept lion, who advances, though he is rained on and blown by the wind, and both eyes kindle, he goes out after cattle or sheep, or it may be deer in the wilderness, and his belly is urgent upon him to get inside of a close steading and go for the sheep flocks. So Odysseus was ready to face young girls with well-ordered hair, naked though he was, for the need was on him, and yet he appeared terrifying to them, all crusted with dry spray, and they scattered one way and another down the jutting beaches. Only the daughter of Alkinu stood fast, for Athene put courage into her heart, and took the fear from her body, and she stood her ground and faced him, and now Odysseus debated whether to supplicate the well-favoured girl by clasping her knees, or stand off where he was and in words of blandishment ask if she would show him the city, and lend him clothing. Then in the division of his heart this way seemed best to him, to stand well off and supplicate in words of blandishment, for fear that, if he clasped her knees, the girl might be angry. So blandishingly and full of craft he began to address her, I am at your knees, O queen. But are you mortal or goddess? If indeed you are one of the gods who hold wide heaven, then I must find in you the nearest likeness to Artemis the daughter of great Zeus, for beauty, figure, and stature. But if you are one among those mortals who live in this country, three times blessed are your father and the lady your mother. And three times blessed your brothers too, and I know their spirits are warmed forever with happiness at the thought of you, seeing such a slip of beauty taking her place in the chorus of dancers, but blessed at the heart, even beyond these others, is that one who, after loading you down with gifts, leads you as his bride home. I have never with these eyes seen anything like you, neither man nor woman. Wonder takes me as I look on you. Yet in Delos once I saw such a thing, by Apollo's altar. I saw the stalk of a young palm shooting up. I had gone there once, and with a following of a great many people, on that journey which was to mean hard suffering for me. And as, when I looked upon that tree, my heart admired it long, since such a tree had never yet sprung from the earth, so now, lady, I admire you and wonder, and am terribly afraid to clasp you by the knees. The hard sorrow is on me. Yesterday on the twentieth day I escaped the wine blue sea, until then the current and the tearing winds had swept me along from the island Ogygia, and my fate has landed me here, here too I must have evil to suffer, I do not think it will stop, before then the gods have much to give me. Then have pity, O queen. You are the first I have come to after much suffering, there is no one else that I know of here among the people who hold this land and this city. Show me the way to the town and give me some rag to wrap me in, if you had any kind of piece of cloth when you came here, and then may the gods give you everything that your heart longs for, may they grant you a husband and a house and sweet agreement in all things, for nothing is better than this, more steadfast than when two people, a man and his wife, keep a harmonious household, a thing that brings much distress to the people who hate them and pleasure to their well-wishers, and for them. The Best Reputation 
Then in turn Nausicaa of the white arms answered him, My friend, since you seem not like a thoughtless man, nor a mean one, it is Zeus himself, the Olympian, who gives people good fortune, to each single man, to the good and the bad, just as he wishes, and since he must have given you yours, you must even endure it. But now, since it is our land and our city that you have come to, you shall not lack for clothing nor anything else, of those gifts which should befall the unhappy suppliant on his arrival, and I will show you our town, and tell you the name of our people. It is the Phaeacians who hold this territory and city, and I myself am the daughter of great-hearted Alkinus, whose power and dominion are held by right, given from the Phaeacians. She spoke, and to her attendants with well-ordered hair gave instruction, Stand fast, girls. Where are you flying, just because you have looked on a man? Do you think this is some enemy coming against us? There is no such man living nor can there ever be one who can come into the land of the Phaeacians bringing warlike attack, we are so very dear to the immortals, and we live far apart by ourselves in the wash of the great sea at the utter end, nor do any other people mix with us. But, since this is some poor wanderer who has come to us, we must now take care of him, since all strangers and wanderers are sacred in the sight of Zeus, and the gift is a light and a dear one. So, my attendants, give some food and drink to the stranger, and bathe him, where there is shelter from the wind, in the river. She spoke, and they stopped their flight, encouraging each other, and led Odysseus down to the sheltered place, as Nausicaa daughter of great-hearted Alkinus had told them to do, and laid out for him to wear a mantle and tunic, and gave him limpid olive oil in a golden oil flask, and told him he could bathe himself in the stream of the river. Then the glorious Odysseus spoke to these serving maids, Stand as you are, girls, a little away from me, so that I can wash the salt off my shoulders and use the olive oil on them. It is long since my skin has known any ointment. But I will not bathe in front of you, for I feel embarrassed in the presence of lovely-haired girls to appear all naked. He spoke, and they went away and told it to their young mistress. But when great Odysseus had bathed in the river and washed from his body the salt brine, which clung to his back and his broad shoulders, he scraped from his head the scurf of brine from the barren salt sea. But when he had bathed all, and anointed himself with olive oil, and put on the clothing this unwed girl had given him, then Athene, daughter of Zeus, made him seem taller for the eye to behold, and thicker, and on his head she arranged the curling locks that hung down like hyacinth in petals. And as when a master craftsman overlays gold on silver, and he is one who was taught by Hephaestos and Pallas Athene in art complete, and grace is on every work he finishes, so Athene gilded with grace his head and his shoulders, and he went a little aside and sat by himself on the seashore, radiant in grace and good looks, and the girl admired him. It was to her attendants with well-ordered hair that she now spoke, hear me, my white arm serving women, let me say something. It is not against the will of all the gods on Olympos that this man is here to be made known to the godlike Phaeacians. A while ago he seemed an unpromising man to me. Now he even resembles one of the gods, who hold high heaven. If only the man to be called my husband could be like this one, a man living here, if only this one were pleased to stay here. But come, my attendants, give some food and drink to the stranger. So she spoke, and they listened well to her and obeyed her, and they set food and drink down beside Odysseus. He then, noble and long-suffering Odysseus, eagerly ate and drank, since he had not tasted food for a long time. Then Nausicaa of the white arms thought what to do next. She folded the laundry and put it away in the fine mule wagon, and yoked the mules with powerful hooves, and herself mounted, and urged Odysseus and spoke a word and named him by title, Rise up now, stranger, to go to the city, so I can see you to the house of my own prudent father, where I am confident you will be made known to all the highest Phaeacians. Or rather, do it this way, you seem to me not to be thoughtless. While we are still among the fields and the lands that the people work, for that time follow the mules and the wagon, walking lightly along with the maids, and I will point the way to you. But when we come to the city, and around this is a towering wall, and a handsome harbour either side of the city, and a narrow causeway, and along the road there are oarswept ships drawn up, for they all have slips, one for each vessel, and there is the place of assembly, put together with quarried stone, and built around a fine precinct of Poseidon, and there they tend to all that gear that goes with the black ships, the hawsers and the sails, and there they find down their oar blades, for the 
Phaeacians have no concern with the bow or the quiver, but it is all masts and the oars of ships and the balanced vessels themselves, in which they delight in crossing over the grey sea, and it is their graceless speech I shrink from, for fear one may mock us hereafter, since there are insolent men in our community, and see how one of the worst sort might say when he met us, who is this large and handsome stranger whom Nausicaa has with her, and where did she find him? Surely, he is to be her husband, but is he astray from some ship of alien men she found for herself, since there are no such hereabouts? Or did some god after much entreaty come down in answer to her prayers, out of the sky, and all his days will he have her? Better so, if she goes out herself and finds her a husband from elsewhere, since she pays no heed to her own Phaeacian neighbours, although many of these and the best ones court her. So they will speak, and that would be a scandal against me, and I myself would disapprove of a girl who acted so, that is, without the goodwill of her dear father and mother making friends with a man, before being formally married. Then, stranger, understand what I say, in order soon to win escort and a voyage home from my father. You will find a glorious grove of poplars sacred to Athene near the road, and a spring runs there, and there is a meadow about it, and there is my father's estate and his flowering orchard, as far from the city as the shout of a man will carry. Sit down there and wait for time enough for the rest of us to reach the town and make our way to my father's palace. But when you estimate that we shall have reached the palace, then go to the city of the Phaeacians and inquire for the palace of my father, great-hearted Alkinus. This is easily distinguished, so an innocent child could guide you there, for there are no other houses built for the other Phaeacians anything like the house of the hero Alkinus. But when you have disappeared inside the house and the courtyard, then go on quickly across the hall until you come to my mother, and she will be sitting beside the hearth, in the firelight, turning sea purple yarn on a distaff, a wonder to look at, and leaning against the pillar, and her maids are sitting behind her, and there is my father's chair of state, drawn close beside her, on which he sits when he drinks his wine like any immortal. Go on past him and then with your arms embrace our mother's knees, do this, so as to behold your day of homecoming with happiness and speed, even if you live very far off. For if she has thoughts in her mind that are friendly to you, then there is hope that you can see your own people, and come back to your strong-founded house, and to the land of your fathers. So Nausicaa spoke and with the shining lash whipped up her mules, and swiftly they left the running river behind them, and the mules, neatly twinkling their feet, ran very strongly, but she drove them with care, so that those on foot, Odysseus and the serving maids, could keep up, and used the whip with discretion. And the sun went down and they came to the famous grove, sacred to Athene, and there the great Odysseus sat down and immediately thereafter prayed to the daughter of great Zeus, hear me, Atratone child of Zeus of the Aegis, and listen to me now, since before you did not listen to my stricken voice as the famous shaker of the earth battered me. Grant that I come, as one loved and pitied, among the Phaeacians. So he spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athene heard him, but she did not yet show herself before him, for she respected her father's brother, Poseidon, who still nursed a sore anger at godlike Odysseus until his arrival in his own country.